thank you everybody for being here tonight. As Alan said, Dave, uh, my name is Francesco Spagnola. I'm the curator of the Magic Collection. I curated the exhibition Global India, which we're putting in context uh, tonight. And as the scarf around my neck may suggest, I came down with a nasty cold this week. So luckily for everyone involved, I will be extremely short in my opening remarks. Uh, but I do need to say that tonight's panel is the beginning of the coronation of the dream for me. Uh, when some years back I began the solitary work of exploring the Indian holdings of the Nathis collection and to document, I started with the manuscripts. There are about 130 manuscripts. Uh, most of them are liturgical manuscripts from the various synagogues in Kerala. And then, of course, there were the, for me, ever mysterious Malayalam uh, manuscripts. And as soon as I moved to Berkeley, I, I started calling the library and the colleagues and say, is there anybody who can read Malayalam? And so we're, we're getting closer to that. We're getting closer and closer to that goal. Uh, but uh, starting with the manuscripts and then, uh, and then continue plotting my way through the collection through the amazing aid of our colleagues here, our registrar, John Franklin here at the, at the, at the Magnus, uh, really rediscovering a collection that was put together about 45 years ago and never fully Praised and understood in its, uh, in its details. So a lot of the work that we've done over the last year was to create big piles of the different provenance of the materials and then start going deeper and deeper and more into, into the materials and discover it. What you see in the exhibition is about a tenth of the whole collection. So it's one of the largest collections of this kind in, in the world. And so um, when I began this solitary work of exploring it, I was sincerely hoping that they would attract this collection will attract the interest of scholars from a host of disciplines and ignite new scholarship. Assistance from my friend and colleague, Barbara Johnson, who's not here tonight, but she's here in spirit, and uh, I think even more than that, I think she hears everything we are saying, from Ithaca uh, College, uh, uh, was essential. And so was a visit this spring by Shalva Bayo from Jerusalem. Among other things, they both led to establishing new connections on the East University campus and at Stanford, and the fact that we're all here together tonight is very much a result of those peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, network of uh, scholarship within the campus and, and, and beyond. Uh, so both colleagues uh, who are not here tonight are very much the reason why we're here tonight. Uh, the, the rules of the game for tonight's panel uh, are quite simple. We are bringing together major scholars of Saudi and I and inviting them to reflect upon a collection that is being unveiled really for the first time in, in, in over 40 years. And it's like a, sort of like a veritable time capsule if you think about it. It's a collection that was already not representing Jewish life when it was put together at the end of the 1960s. There were very few Jews left in Kerala. So it's the memory of the memory of the presence. Okay, so it's uh, several times removed. And, um, and so uh, the, the panel is the result of several fascinating conversations with Lawrence Cohen who's uh, very up to sitting at the center of this table uh, tonight. Lawrence visited the Magnus as the research for the exhibition was going on, and has been following the work we've been doing here step by step. Together, we designed tonight's discussion as a truly multidisciplinary discussion. And as every multidisciplinary context, essentially, we kind of know what we're putting in, what we're putting on the table, we're laying out, but we're not really sure what the outcome will be. Although my main question for this uh, panel and in general for, uh, for the work to do after an exhibition is put up, etc., is what next? What do we do next? The exhibition is a chance to, to catalyze energies and, and attention, but uh, the collection still needs to be explored further. And, and so what directions do we take this together as a group, no longer as a solitary work of a curator in a back room of a museum? Uh, we, so we don't know exactly what will emerge, but we do know that the topics discussed will involve language and literature, history and anthropology, music and political science, and that each of the contributors will help us broaden our understanding of the global world represented in the Magnus collection, documenting a small and everything but margin community of men and women across Kerala, Israel, and Europe. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present tonight. This way you'll find out what the order is. <laughs> uh, with, uh, <coughs> 
So that's why I'm doing it pre accurately so that everybody's informed. But uh, Lawrence Cohen is a professor of anthropology and South in Southeast East Asia Studies, and Sarah Kawa, chair of Asia Studies and chair of the Center for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley. Robert Goldman, who's sitting at his right, um, is professor of Sanskrit at the Catherine and William uh, Magistretti, I don't know if it's the right <laughs> pronunciation, <laughs> distinguished professor in South and Southeast Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. Blake Wentworth, at uh, Lawrence's left, is assistant professor of Tamil Studies at UC Berkeley. Matthew Baxter, Political Science and Center for South Asian Studies, uh, recently filed his dissertation in December. In December. Oh, it's easy. Okay, recent will be will forget. Right, you got it. And and last but very much not least, from Stanford is joining us Anna Schultz, assistant professor of ethnomusicology, uh, who has uh, a lot of visual materials, and uh, we're we're keeping that treat as the last one for the panel. So it's my real pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's uh, discussion. Uh, each contributor will will present a case, a case study, a, a set of ideas. And then we'll see what we can do again. So thank you very much, everyone, for the participation. Good evening. Thank you.
Second, Kuwaiti and others took as the village as dominant social structure anywhere in India that is caste. And third, to the village's relation, assumed at the time, to high culture. Here in the high culture, or as it became called, the great tradition of the 1950s, both Judaism and Hinduism, in relation to the little tradition of the village. Many of Mandelbaum's claims about what happened to Judaism when it comes to India were based on thoughtful observation, but based on this commonly accepted trend, this lens of village, caste, and great versus little tradition. That's how he saw uh, uh, what he was doing. Many other questions were put aside, as we do, in the lenses we bring. And one of the things I find exciting in wandering through this exhibit is to see how some of these other questions of the Kerala Jew centuries of participation, for example, in the circuits of exchange, the contest and the encounter across the Indian Ocean, of the importance of the many political and ideological movements, including but not limited to Zionism, that mattered across South India, across Asia, and across the world over the 20th century, which we can see in the diaries of this exhibit, of the practices and forms of the colonial British state, the lives of Jews and others, of the particular regional religious and literary norms and values of South Indian Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, and they help us think about the demands of the world's Jews and others. The other line of thought, briefly, that the exhibit opens up for me is the broader question of what is a Jew in India. There are many studies, some excellent, some less so, of the Jews of India. These Jews are treated a little bit too mysteriously. Who are the Jews of India? One book title proclaims. It's kind of a mystery. But the first time I came to India, a Bengali friend in Kolkata told me that you see, we Bengalis are the Jews of India. Meaning, he went on, that we are smarter than the rest of the country. <laughs> the Marwari community, I was told, are the real Jews of India because of their success in business and finance. Later, for different or similar reasons, I was told Punjabis, Chetniars, Parsis, Ismailis, and Jains were the real Jews of India. In fact, after the first year I spent in India, the real question came to be not who are the Jews of India, but rather who could possibly not be, as almost everyone at one time or another seemed to be the Jews of India. In other words, the central question should not be the reclamation of the non-Ashkenazi Mizrahi Jew for Obscurity, a project that, however understandable, arguably betrays some of the worst instincts of European colonialism and its understandings of race. But rather, what does it mean to be Jewish in India in the 20th century? And here we confront what I'm calling the ubiquity of the Jew as an ideological element of modern Indian culture. Ubiquity may be a strong word, for the Yehudi or Jew is not a universal figure of contemplation, in much of rural India over that century, but the Yehudi is surprisingly present across the north and south, east and west, rural and cosmopolitan India, and the three nations that it forms with the colonization. Here I will suggest, for I am no expert, three possible reasons for this relative ubiquity. Perhaps most obviously, the British understanding of the Jew as a figure in the background over the 19th century of Dickens and Israeli and Daniel Deronda, Secondly, long-standing Islamic and Christian cosmological, cosmological understandings of the Jew in history and in ethics, and how these in turn inflected by the Indian Ocean world in which people of three continents continually move. And finally, and I think most importantly, the theatrical and musical forms that move out of Persia and come over the Indian Ocean to Western India and become the basis for the Parsi theater the dominant urban performance genre in the colonial cities of the 19th and early 20th centuries in India linked to the Zoroastrian or Parsi community in which the Yehudi and his daughter, the Yehudi Kivedi, are central figures of heroic pathos and become central to the new 20th century world of the modern Indian film. Thank you, uh, Francesco, for organizing this uh, very interesting event and exhibition. And thank you for being here. Uh, I hope in a few 
minutes of the time that I have allocated to me to uh, try to address a little bit of the question from Francesco at the beginning of the what next, uh, where to go from that. And, and in order to do that, I want to talk about a little about the, the complex instantiation and diversity of Jews in India, because we sometimes see them at the wrong end of the telescope. It's just these Jews that we focus here on Kerala. But each of these communities is in a very complex uh, conversation with each other. And Berkeley is a good place for us to start to look at this and maybe develop some further exhibitions, for example, at the Magnus of Jewish uh, art, artifacts from all places in, in South Asia, because there were substantial Jewish communities in Kolkata, in Delhi, Old Delhi, in Ahmedabad, and also in Karachi and other places. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit, but I, I like, like Lawrence, I'm not a specialist in this, but I do believe Berkeley has this history. Uh, Lawrence has spoken of uh, David Mandelbaum, whom I knew when, when I first came here as a young faculty member. And there's also the forgotten scholar, perhaps, Walter Fischel, who was a scholar of the Jews of India, who was in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Berkeley uh, back in the uh, 1970s. So he uh, also made considerable contributions. So I want to talk a little bit how I got involved in this. Um, I, uh, I was curious about the nature of the Jews in India. I, I used to, for many years, live in Western India, in Bombay and in Pune. And there's a large synagogue in uh, Pune, built by the Sassoons, who were uh, some of the elite among one of the many Jewish communities in India, that is the Baghdadi Jews, uh, who had emigrated uh, from the Middle East under various forms of persecution in the 19th century, uh, and built this large red sandstone building with a large steeple on it. And this speaks to the kind of the mainstream understanding. If everyone is the Jews of India, who actually are the Jews of India? Because the mainstream people had no idea what Jews were or what that even meant. If you asked them what that building was, they would say in the Shah, Parsi church, or red temple, or whatever, mosque. Nobody knew what a synagogue was. I used to go to the services. They were interesting. They services there are done in Arabic. So there's a very great linguistic diversity. These uh, services are done in Arabic. The um, uh, Israeli and uh, Paradesi, so uh, of course, work in Malayalam. You have, of course, the, the Jews of the uh, Konkan coast, whose uh, language, the liturgical language and musical language is Marathi. Uh, so these, these could be uh, looked at. So, if I were to give a small presentation of this, I, I think I would entitle it The King and I. You see, let me take you back a little bit. About 43 years ago, I was sitting in the coffee shop of the uh, old Taj Mahal Hotel in what was then Bombay on a very dark, rainy monsoon evening with my friend and colleague, uh, Jeffrey Mason. Yes, that Jeffrey Mason. Mm -hmm. Very good. While we were sitting talking, waiting, some of the <coughs> India hands will remember the good old days when the airlines flying to India used to send a private car for anybody flying out of India. Days are long gone. In those days, there were very few, frankly, Western travelers to India. Uh, and while we were waiting for the car to show up and sitting having our coffee, an elderly gentleman came up to the table and he stared at us with great intensity. And I said to him, can I help you, sir? And he said, you look like a couple of Jews. <laughs> I said, well, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, we're a couple of Jews, and what is that to you? To me, you don't know who I am? I said, no. I am Sinovitz, the king of the Jews of India. <laughs> so I became a little interested in this. Who is the Sinovitz, the king of the Jews of India? He was clearly a European Ashkenazi Jew. Turns out to have been a refugee from Bialystok in Poland during the Holocaust. Came to Bombay and really became, in a sense, the king of the Jews of that community and many others too. He was the fixer. He was also working for the Israel uh, committee that was then beginning emigration to Indian Jews to Israel. And when Jews there had a problem, got into trouble, Sinovitz was the fixer. He would call up the, uh, the bureaucrats in the middle of the night, get people out of the airport, whatever it took. Sinovitz was in charge. So I and I began to think, well, what are these different communities that we can, you know, uh, uh, imagine uh, these, these Kerala Jews? And, and 
and the interactions that they had over time. Now, it turns out that these so-called Venezuelan Jews, as they called themselves, knew very little. Each of these communities has a kind of interesting, mythical, originary story. They all got shipwrecked on the coast of Kerala in the first century and so on and so forth. There's very little historical documentation uh, for these kind of claims. The Bene Israeli traced their lineage to, in a kind of Noah's Ark-like uh, legend of a ship that wrecked off Navgam in the Karnataka, um, in the Konkan coast, and seven couples survived and became progenitors, uh, and so on and so forth. They knew very little about Judaism. Over the centuries, they had forgotten. Uh, they knew the Shema. They uh, observed the Sabbath. Hence, they can, tended to be called the Shamwatelis, the Saturday oil guys because they didn't do their work pressing on Shabbos. Uh, but they couldn't read Hebrew. And how did they come? Now, this uh, Professor Sheldon Newmark out at the uh, American Bible College has done some research on this. These people were educated, Judaized, if you like, by a combination of some of the Cochin Pardesi Jews as a kind of noblesse of lead, because they tended to look down on these people. And interestingly, by a succession of American English and Scottish missionaries who set about in the 19th century to convert these Jews to Christianity by teaching them the Old Testament. And it didn't exactly work. It worked to make them Jewish. Uh, they learned Hebrew. They learned the Old Testament. They learned the books. Uh, and they learned how to uh, be Jewish in some meaningful sense that they had not had before. And very, very few of them actually that in itself is a, a rather interesting story. Um, some of these uh, groups had their own little, I mean, what the uh, Mandelbaum would have seen as caste, but they did somewhat mirror the uh, ambient uh, sociology in which they found themselves. So we have these references to white Jews, <coughs> black Jews, and sometimes you see the expression brown Jews, referring to these uh, Meshul Harim, who were manumitted slaves who belonged were acknowledged as Jewish, but were not permitted to join a minion, were not permitted to go and read from the Torah, they would not interdine or intermarry with the more elite Jews, nor until very recently would the white Jews intermarry with the so-called black Jews. And that kind of casteist attitude was taken up by the first, <coughs> actually probably the first Indian Jew to get a university degree. It was Abraham Barak uh, uh, Selim, who, uh, Selim, who began a kind of what you might call Gandhian Satyagraha type of uh, uh, movement to try to more and better integrate these uh, communities and finally succeeded. So by, by the early uh, mid 20th century and a little bit later, those kind of exclusions tended to dissipate and especially as people began to in the Zionist movement. So uh, I, I think it would be very useful if, if uh, scholars at Berkeley and especially at the Magnuson start to look at some of these other communities and build a kind of uh, collection on South Asian Jewelry, which has a fascinating story. At the time, I didn't know whether the sign of this was just some prank or pose or whatever it was. So I began to do a little research on that. I was very puzzled at the time. Um, Finally, our car came, got on the plane, was sitting for the plane to take off, and another gentleman sits down next to me. And I started to chat with him. I said, who are you? He says, my name is Jan Spitz. I'm the king of the Jews of India. <laughs> centuries BCE, it far transcends just the Jewish presence. So you have 
people moving from caravans out of the Mediterranean down either the Persian Gulf or the Red Sea, shipping over to coastal Gujarat, down to the west south coast of India, onto the Straits of Malacca, into the South China Sea, and we're up to Guangzhou. Um, and there's an enormous amount of, of cultural variation, and regional variation there. Now, by the same token, it's clear that in Kerala, the Jewish presence becomes important early, precisely because in some ways it's foreign, so I want to talk a little bit about that. I think anyone who goes to Cochin will see the lovely synagogue that's there, of course, and also the colorfully of directly named Jewtown, which is the, the heart of the spice trade that moves out of Kerala. Um, these two things, particularly the, the spice trade, have long roots. So let me, let me talk about this a bit by talking about two copper plate inscriptions uh, that mark the first recorded presence of Jews in India. This is not to say that there isn't earlier foreign presence. Um, in the 7th or 8th century, we already have crosses on the Kerala coast that have Christian Pallavi writing on them. Uh, but these inscriptions are a bit later. So let me start with the first one. These copper plates are known as the column plates of Stanrem. And so let's take you there. If I can use the teacher's friend Google Earth. <laughs> A little too much zoom there. Okay. Hmm. Well, it's not helpful at all. It doesn't give me the opportunity to pan out. So you know what I'm going to do? It's in Kerala. It's just a little bit south of Cochin. Okay. <coughs> Farewell, Google Earth. Now, okay. There's the important stuff. These copper plates were promulgated in 849 CE. And what they do is they give land, they give tax concessions, they give slaves, and they give trade rights to one Mar Sapir Iso, who is a founder of a mercantile center in Kerala and a major figure in the Syrian Christian Church of Tarsus in southern Turkey. <coughs> so the Jews yet haven't made their presence at this point in 849 CE in the copper plates. Um, what we have in this grant is the first recording of an influential permanent settlement of traders from foreign lands on the Kerala coast. And Mar Sapir Iso, who is the recipient of this grant, is described as the founder of a nugget. So that word is important. Uh, it means a mercantile trading center that has walls and taxes are executed for people to pass through those walls. So, Mar Sapir Iso appears to have been invited to settle in this area by the local king. Why would this have happened? Um, it involves regional power politics where the Pandian kingdom of the southern Sibir had a very thriving international harbor. And this fledgling ruling polity of the Chedas also needed a harbor. So they're willing to give a lot of concessions to someone who can make this a thriving city. <coughs> this happens right after a significant military victory against the king who's giving this grant. So he's fairly desperate to make sure that he can get some serious revenue quickly. And let me just give a sense of what these things look like. As you can see them up on the wall here. These replicate the copper, or excuse me, the palm leaves that they would have been recorded on. Uh, and so these are permanent honorary copies. Honorary to the extent that they're still possessed by the Christian churches now that they were given to uh, a thousand years and change ago. So they're written in the Tamil language. Important to note that Malayalam and Tamil had not diverged at this time period in the 49. And then there's a very mysterious overscript in the center, and if anybody can read it, I'd love to know what it means, but it's still undecided. Um, and I'll just move quickly through these plates till we get to something very interesting. You can see they're kind of beaten on, but still fairly good condition. And all in Tamil so far in Vakaratya. But then we come to an interesting phenomenon which is the signatories to this grant. So these would be the witnesses that are present at the execution of the grant and the conferral of land uh, are presented in various scripts indicating their foreign presence. So we have uh, Kufi Arabic, we have Pallavi, we have Vatarti, and we have Hebrew. And so if you look, this is the back of this plate, you can see signatories in Judeo-Persian. And right above in Pallavi. Now I have neither of these scripts, so this is what I've been told by 
this chair. Um, what's going on in this grant? It's a long one, so I don't want to give you the whole thing, but I can tell you in, in sum, um, Mars of Pio Iso is being given land for the execution of his trade. That land is his to control, which means it's independent of the control of the king who's conferring it. Taxes are remitted so that he doesn't have to pay the customary dues to the local lord. Symbolic privileges of rule are granted. And I want to get back into that a little bit more later, which means that Mara Iso has the right to carry a parasol. He has the right to ride on a horse. He has the right to pr uh, process through a ceremonial gate. More on this in a moment, but just to get ahead of myself. This kind of cultural conferral makes no sense outside of India. This really indicates a strong and, and stable bond between these foreign traders and the local Jewish presence, because otherwise it makes no cultural sense whatsoever. Still further, Mar Sopir Iso is given the right to execute, execute law on his land. So punitive law from his own foreign culture is perfectly acceptable within his walls. And then we have a very interesting line. And this is where the Jewish presence comes in and these signatures start to make sense. Namely, two trade guilds, the Anjuwanam and the Money Gramam, <coughs> are called upon to make sure that the grant is enforced as long as the sun shall shine and the moon shall stand, etc., etc. The Anjuwanam and the Money Gramam are interesting terms. Both of them refer to trade guilds, and for quite a while they were thought to be synonymous. Um, they're not. What, what, what happened right about this point is you have a major splitting of trade guilds between those that are primarily concerned with the inland riverine systems and those that are cons um, concerned with long haul oceanic shipping. The Anjuwanam is the long haul oceanic, ship oceanic shipping guild and it consists primarily of Arabs and Jews at this point. The money problem is local and tunnel. All the signatories here are from the Anjuwanam. So these are signatories from the guild saying, yes, indeed, they will execute this grant in perpetuity. So we don't have a direct record of Jewish presence in this uh, inscription, other than in sort of a shadow of terms of, as signatories to the grant. We don't really understand their own cultural presence in the land at this point. We do, however, in a grant that comes about 100 years later. And this is the second and final grant that I'd like to speak about. A very famous, let's see if I can put it in here. Yeah, nice. Um, this grant was promulgated in the convenient year 1000 um, <laughs> under the kingship of a king named Bhaskara Rabi I, local ruler of, of the Kerala country, also composed in the Tamil language, also inscribed in Vakteriti script. And what we have here is the conferral of royal privileges <coughs> on the Jewish merchant of the Anjuwanam. So of this Oceanic Shipping Guild, named Joseph Robin. So, I just want to go over the inscription a little bit to, to note some of the really fascinating things that are happening here. Um, very standard inscriptional beginnings, nothing surprising there. Um, but note that the direct uh, claim of royal authority in the control of this grant, that's not a universal feature. Very often governors or lesser lords would be conferring grants. So the fact that the king himself is giving this grant is an indication of the strong links behind uh, foreign trade on the coasts and more inland central political polities. We note immediately that Joseph Rabin is not uh, identified by any other feature other than that he's a member of the Anjuman. It's interesting at this point. This could well mean that the Anjuman and the Jewish trading presence are for this king synonymous rather than being broken into different factions. So, he gets his tax remissions, he gets his dues, but most of this you see is the conferral of these royal privileges. Where he has the right to use a lamp in the daytime, to use decorative cloths to sit upon. Uh, he's carried in a palanquin, very nice. He gets the, the parasol, the, the peerless symbol of royal prerogative, and so forth. The trumpets blast when he walks around, he gets to process through the ceremony of art gateway in the arches, his house can be built in a specifically royal, lordly way, and so forth. These are privileges that make no sense whatsoever outside of the larger articulation of Indian political systems. Um, the sumptuary, aesthetic, and gustatory qualities of lordship, being an Indian king, are what are being conferred to this merchant right here. This 
means that he is there for some time. This is a stable presence. And that he's essentially being treated as a liege lord in the larger articulation of politics in coastal Kerala at this point. And you note the end of the, the grant says exactly this. Um, that this prerogative that he's been given as the director of this trade guild will pass through his own hereditary descent, both on the male and the female side. Interesting there. Um, matrilineal possibilities out of that area of Kerala, certainly. But I'm not certain I want to be that confident in saying that's why it is. It certainly is quite interesting. Um, the Anjuvanam starts to set down permanent bases on Kerala soil, right about this time, in the year 1000. And without taking too much time, I just wanted to look at uh, some of the ideas behind this conferral of privilege. I think the one that's most important to me, uh, in terms of referring to the Jewish presence in Kerala, is that these claims to territory in India are being governed by a basic sense that the sea is a neutral zone over which polities can extend their trade and share cultural exchange, but it's not sought as a place to control. It's very, very rare in the history of the Indian Ocean trading systems that a single polity will try to control the waters. And for this reason, the ocean coast, in contrast, for example, to coastal China, where the sea can often be seen as a, a zone of threat, the coast of Kerala becomes a zone of opportunity, one in which kings will do almost anything such as the setting up of these special economic development zones to ensure that a good amount of revenue is coming in. And we know from subsequent inscriptions in history that this Jewish presence never left. And uh, I think it's a fairly minimal presence in Kolum today after emigrations to Israel, but it's still there. Thanks. South Indian Jew named Abraham Barak Salem, whose diaries constitute an important part of the Global <coughs> India exhibition here at the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. As a lawyer, you see Salem consumed with trials inside and outside the court. As a periodic member of a legislative council, we see him constantly concerned with elections. As a husband and father, we see him celebrating his 23rd year of married life. As a man in his 50s, we see him in conversation with his doctor over heart medication. As a figure of influence, we see him investing in financial matters, taxes, and a chamber of commerce, he even buys a going lottery ticket that month. As a labor activist, we see him providing advice at worker meetings and attentive to strikes by local rope makers. And as a prominent member of Cochin's Jewish community, we see him pray regularly, entertain guests from Palestine, and play an active role in a synagogue. And on the 21st of November, 1938, uh, the synagogue held a special prayer recited for the German Jews' persecution by Hitler and the Nazis. This special prayer was a response to Kristallnacht, the pogrom against Jews in Austria 75 years ago this month, that entailed the murder of Jews, the widespread destruction of Jewish property, such as shops and synagogues, and the mass incarceration of Jews in concentration camps that foreshadowed Hitler's final solution. Reports of the events were central in turning global opinion against Hitler, sparked international outrage, and represented the peak of German opposition the Nazis' racial, racial policies. My short presentation today briefly touches on perhaps one of the most surprising yet troubling responses to Kristallnacht, that of Mahatma Gandhi, and how such troubling particularly concerned two Jews living in Palestine at the time, the San Francisco-born Judah Magnus, after whom this collection of Jewish art and life is named, and the German-born theologian Martin Buber. The question that subsequently arises engages the regional imaginary of this exhibit in Global India, namely Kerala, Israel, Berkeley, and could, I suggest, be simply posed as, what would it mean to be a Jewish Gandhi? This is the Jewish Gandhi question. On the one hand, a Jewish Gandhi may seem hopeful. Such hopefulness is captured in the figure of Abraham Barak, uh, uh, Barak Salem himself, sometimes simply referred to as a Jewish Gandhi. Uh, because of the ways in which he modeled his own demands for social justice in, which is, uh, in what is now the South Indian state of Kerala. Salem was born into the lowest rung of the trifurcated Indian Jewish community in Cochin. Such lowness is articulated in ways familiar to those who study Indian caste, as Bob mentioned. 
Uh, Salem's particular community of Cochin Jews was forced to sit in the back of the synagogue, was last to participate in Jewish services, uh, played a servile role in Jewish rituals, was not allowed access to the burial grounds of higher community Jews, had segregated ceremonies such as weddings and circumcisions and so forth. Salem led a social and religious reform movement of Cochin Jews through acts of nonviolent civil disobedience modeled on Gandhi and Satyagraha, such as fasts and refusing acts of segregation and degradation. From the 1920s to the 1940s, Salem, as a Jewish Gandhi, made substantial gains towards establishing more egalitarian relations among the three communities of Cochin Jews. On the other hand, and this is the hand that I will focus on, a Jewish Gandhi may seem horrifying. On the 26th of November, 1938, in the immediate wake of Kristallnacht, Gandhi published an essay simply titled The Jews. Despite claiming that, quote, my sympathies are all with the Jews, the untouchables of Christianity, Gandhi's essay is disturbing. He claims that the Jews of Germany should engage in nonviolent resistance or satyagraha against the Nazis rather than seek a national home in Palestine. Such a position was premised on an act of comparison with his own experiences in South Africa and encouraged Gandhi to embrace the possibility of Jewish massacre. He writes, the calculated violence of Hitler may even result in a general massacre of the Jews by way of his first answer to the declaration of such satyagraha. But if the Jewish mind could be prepared for voluntary suffering, even the massacre I've imagined could be turned into a day of thanksgiving and joy that Jehovah had, had wrought deliverance of the race. For the God-fearing, death has no terror. It is a joyful sleep to be followed by waking that would be all the more refreshing for the long sleep. In moments made in, sub in, in statements made in subsequent months, Gandhi's reproach of the Jews for failing to embrace such joyful sleep is fairly definitive. He rebukes the Jews for having violence in their hearts for their oppressors, for never, for never having practiced nonviolence as an article of faith or even as a deliberate policy, given that the stigma against them, he writes, is that their ancestors crucified Jesus and that Jewish nonviolence had and has no love in it. It is passive, so fully of anger over the German atrocities that Jews are incapable of loving the enemy. As he writes in one passage, I can conceive the necessity of the immolation of hundreds, if not thousands. Gandhi had made less graphic but not entirely dissimilar remarks before. For example, in an interview given to the Jewish Chronicle in October 1931, though he praises the Jews' spirit of cohesion, spirit of comradeship, vision, and claims to have never been able to understand this antipathy to the Jews, he also claims that the spirit was lacking in the few Jewish services he attended, which he found overly ceremonial. He claims that, quote, Zionism, meaning re uh, reoccupation of Palestine, has no attraction for him, and suggests that the remedy for anti-Semitism is for Christians to learn the virtue of tolerance, the toleration and charity, and for Jews to rid themselves of the causes for such reproach as may be justly laid at their door. In quick response, a few months later, to December 1931, the managing editor of the Jewish Advocate, the organ of Indian Jewelry, writes to Gandhi, quote, I'm very anxious to see you in connection with certain vital Jewish questions and also certain statements made by you to the Jewish press regarding Zionism, which, is, which has filled a certain section of world jewelry with wonder. He continues, as you already know, the Jews of India have a very high admiration for you, and once again, I trust you will give me the opportunity of seeing you so that I may be able to eliminate any misconceptions. Gandhi's comments following Kristallnacht seven years later echoed some of these earlier sentiments, but were expressed in far greater detail during a moment of infinitely greater political sensitivity. Accordingly, reactions to these November 1938 comments were of both extreme emotional intensity, if not shock and horror, as well as deeper reflection. One of the obvious horrified reactions to Gandhi's reproach of Jews and Nazi Germany for being insufficiently nonviolent and failing to embrace Satyagraha can be found in the response of Chaim Greenberg, managing editor of the New York-based um, Jewish Frontier. Uh, quote, a Jewish Gandhi in Germany, should one arise, could function for about five minutes and would be promptly taken to the guillotine. I would like to focus now in the second half of my presentation on two of the more sustained and, I believe, reflective critiques of Gandhi's post-Kristallnacht position on the Jew to help us further explore what a Jewish Gandhi could mean. Both were letters uh, written from Jerusalem in February 1939 by two friends, the, the American board Judah Magnus and the German board Martin Buber. Both Magnus and Buber express a profound sense of betrayal. Magnus writes, quote, your statement is a challenge, particularly to those of us who imagine ourselves your disciples. And Buber writes, despite the fact that he considers Gandhi, quote, a voice that he has long known and honored, what he hears, containing though it does elements of a noble and most praiseworthy conception such as he expects from the speaker, 
is yet barren of all application to his peculiar circumstance. These words are in truth not applied to him at all. They are inspired by most praiseworthy gentle principles, but the listener is aware that, uh, the, 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 the listener is aware that he, the speaker, has, caught, has, has cast not a single glance at the situation of whom he is addressing, of him whom he is addressing. That he sees him not, nor does he know him, and, and the straits under which he labors. Moreover, intermingled, a voice makes itself heard, drowning out the others, the voice of reproach. The nature of this lengthy period of discipleship and honoring of Gandhi, suggested above, among politically active Jews like Magnus and Buber is evident, for example, in Buber's 1930 essay titled Gandhi, Politics, and Us, where we might see suggestions that Zionism and Swaraj, Jewish and Indian self-determination, respectively, were mutually constituted through shared concerns with religious devotion and political independence. However, I now, I now turn briefly to the concerns evident at Magnus's letter to Gandhi and then Buber's before concluding with some reflections on what it could mean to be a Jewish Gandhi. Magnus's concerns are more historical and contextual and circumscribed the limits of Satyagraha. Magnus emphasizes the history of nonviolent suffering that distinguishes the Jews. Quote, if ever a people was a people of nonviolence, through century after century it was the Jews. I think they need learn but little from anyone in faithfulness to their God and in their readiness to suffer. Magnus proceeds to underscore the contextual difference between British India and Nazi Germany in marking the limits of Satyagraha. For with the Jew in Germany, quote, the slightest bit of resistance means killing or concentration camps or being a done, done away with otherwise usually in the dead of night. It makes not even a ripple. Contrast this with one of your fasts or with your salt march to the sea or a visit to the viceroy when the whole world is permitted to hang upon your words and be witness to your acts. Has not this been possible because, despite all the excesses of its imperialism, England is, after all, a democracy with a parliament and a considerable measure of free speech? I wonder if even you would find a way to public opinion in totalitarian Germany, where life is snuffed out like a candle and no one sees or knows that the light is out. Magnus also underscores what he sees as the contextual difference between the British in India and Arabs in Palestine in marking the limits of Satyagraha. Quote, as I have understood Satyagraha, it must, in order to be effective, be offered in front of constituted authority, not in front of roving bandits willing to mutilate babes in their mother's arms. He then encourages Gandhi to speak to the Arabs in terms of Satyagraha. And finally, Magnus weighs, uh, uh, weighs competing claims to belonging and land, ultimately claiming, despite it being, quote, an ugly fact, that a land belongs to that people which is comforted. Hoover shares in many of Magnus' historical and contextual concerns. But Buber presses further to offer points of a more theoretical or textual nature, I suggest. Buber, in effect, moves from criticizing Gandhi's remarks on the Jews to a more subtle critique, turning Gandhi against himself or dismissing Gandhi's premises altogether. I here focus on three, focus on three such concerns before concluding. First, Gandhi is concerned that Jews are mistaking the physical for the ideal and their demand for a national home. Quote, the Palestine of the biblical conception is not a geographical tract. It is in their hearts. Buber responds by emphasizing reality over the symbolic. For Buber asks, should a Jewish Gandhi teach Indians as you teach the Jews? The India of the Vedic conception is not a geographical tract. It is in your hearts. If historical texts like the Bible can lay no claim to a people's belonging to a particular land, Buber suggests, how can one take seriously Gandhi's references to the Vedas and his demand for Swaraj against the British? Second, Gandhi's Satyagraha is premised on personal sacrifice bound to an individual religious faith. Buber, however, finds possibility in community and faith stout. Gandhi's remarks on the Jews emphasize their God-fearing qualities and individuals' faith in a living God and the strength of suffering given to them by Jehovah. Buber, on the other hand, claims, quote, there is no solution to be found in the life of isolated and abandoned individuals. The true solution can only issue from the life of a community which begins to carry out the will of God, often without being aware of doing so, without believing that God exists and this is his will. It may not be Gandhi's individual faith, but communal doubt, Buber suggests, it is the most pregnant of political possibility. Third and finally, Buber interrogates Gandhi's very premise of nonviolence itself. Quote, India, you say, is by nature nonviolent. It was not always so. The Mahabharata is an ethos of warlike, disciplined force. In the greatest of its poems, the Bhagavad Gita, it is told how Arjuna decide, uh, uh, decides on the battlefield that he will not commit the sin of killing his relations who are opposed to him, and he lets fall his bow and arrow. But God reproaches him, saying that such action is unmanly and shameful. There is nothing better for a knight in arms than a just fight. Buber, accordingly, finds space for the possibility of violence. He's, uh, 
uh, he sees in India's past. Quote, if I am to confess what is truth to me, I must say, there is nothing better for me than to deal justly, unless it be to love. We should be able to fight for justice, but to fight lovingly. So what would it mean to be a Jewish Gandhi? If Abraham Barak Salem is a model of what a Jewish Gandhi means in South India, then a Jewish Gandhi seems to be a figure of hope. If Heim Greenberg's assessment indicates what a Jewish Gandhi would mean in Nazi Germany, then a Jewish Gandhi would not only be dead, but perhaps allow the horrors, to paraphrase Magnus, of life snuffed out like a candle, where no one sees or knows that the light is out. If Judah Magnus's concerns are any indication of what a Jewish Gandhi would mean in Palestine, we may wonder whether this Jewish Gandhi would be speaking to the Jews or the Arabs about Satyagraha, or if he would be speaking about Satyagraha at all. Or to take up Martin Buber's concerns, we may wonder if a Jewish Gandhi may be too schizophrenic a creature to exist at all, caught between a just fight and nonviolence, between the possibilities of, of a community doubting God's existence and the suffering of God-fearing individuals of resolute faith, and, do, and between claim, uh, claims about one people's text authorizing forms of belonging while denying such belonging to others. In some ways, the life of Abraham Barak Salem may both provide us with, while depriving us of, further suggested historical or biographical answers to our Jewish Gandhi question, following India's independence and the establishment of Israel. <coughs> Salem, though he helped organize the mass immigration of Cochin Jews to Israel in the 1950s, never went to Israel himself, passing away in Cochin in 1967, the place where he was a lawyer, a legislative council member, a husband and father, a figure of influence, a labor activist, and a prominent member of the Jewish community. Thank you.